Welcome to the inaugural event in our series, Reinventing the Workshop. The fact that Lynn Hegenian has flown here between two classes of hers at Berkeley in order not only to meet with us, but to confer with one of her graduate students, not only about her doctorate, but about a creative collaboration they are currently undertaking, is to my mind already a reinvention of the role of the workshop leader. Why not be creating with your students? Why not be activating every element of what it means to teach down to the very verbs? But what is this crazy little, little verb called work? And what is it doing wedged between writing and shop for the last century? There are earlier antecedents, but for the sake of brevity, I'm gonna cite Charles Baudelaire, who in the mid 1800s made the claim that, quote, inspiration is work. It sounds innocent enough, but I would hazard that it was suggestive of a more pervasive revision of the poetic process, at least in its public portrayal, away from the narrative of the muse arriving unpredictably to the literary elect and toward the idea of reliable labor and the democracy of training and apprenticeship. After all, if inspiration is work and we can all be trained to work, then we can all be inspired or unemployed. <laughs> um, the idea of inspiration as work emerged in the context of other secular and egalitarian industrial era ideals and also Ruskinian concepts of collaborative artistic production. But in many ways, the writing workshop, which arrived as a pedagogical term in the 1930s, though inherently plural in its makeup and constitution, has focused primarily on the evolution of the individual this is, I believe, part of what Lynn will be exploring today in the second part of our event. A writing workshop is a human construct that, re that revises us, just as the making of a chair revises our body and the invention of a light bulb revises our sight. And it is not a judgment on the workshop model to reinvent it. Like all made things, it invites revision. And it is one of the roles of poetry to question structures to notice their deficits and remake them to elicit their unactualized potential. I can think of no greater poet to inaugurate us on our journey of reinvention than Lynn Hegenian. Tonight, she has generously agreed to share her work, and then we will break for a brief intermission, form a circle with our chairs, <laughs> um, and set the room up for the workshop at six. Please join me in welcoming Lynn Hegenian. Thank you, Christina. Um, thanks to Chloe Garcia Thomas, and especially thanks to Mia Yu, the uh, student of mine that was mentioned, um, who's also a very good friend. Um, I'm going to read from this most recent book of mine and not say a lot about it in advance, since we have sort of a, a time frame here before the the workshop like thing. I don't know what, what else to call it at the moment. Um, all right. So just to make sure I get this right. All right. This book is called a book, The Book of a Thousand Eyes. Reposed, inclined, allowed, and nightly liking place, a person rested for, does it matter? in antagonism, in sleep, for love, the fingers closed, for recovery and place, with oblivion arrested. The bed is made of sentences which present themselves as what they are, some soft, some hardly logical, some broken off, sentences granting freedom to memories and sight. Then is freedom about love, bare and clumsily impossible? Our tendernesses give us sentences about our mistakes. Our sentiments go on as described. The ones that answer when we ask someone who is mumbled to say what he or she has said again. In bed, I said I liked the flowing of the air and the cold of night. Such sentences are made to aid the senses. Tonight itself will be made. It's already getting dark. I'm not afraid to look, nor afraid to be seen in the dark. Is there a spectral sentence? 
a spectator one? Is it autobiographical? No, the yearning inherent in the use of any sentence makes it mean far more than we are here. Because we are not innocent of our sentences, we go to bed. The bed shows with utter clarity how sentences in saying something make something. Sentences in bed are not describers, they are instigators. I guess I should explain that this Book of a Thousand Eyes is entirely a night book, um, hence all the th things about sleep, sex, dreams, obsessions, etc. The first hour of this arrangement of thought objects is death-like. Then as sleep encounters nature, it attracts pensive wandering. The westward moving eye follows the sun but so slowly it loses ground. I dream of telling a man to be precise. I want him to discern the ideological form and function of the terms barbarian, local watering hole, and women. I wake, turn, think of turning, widen, until dehumanized I'm something congenial in brain beyond control. The gap between world and mind is sleepable. The concept of same time serves as an invitation to attend while things assimilate, mutate, or aesthetically vacillate. Just as the second hour meets the first, I dream an explanation, but the explanation ramifies. I extrapolate, and that's conditional. There is nothing unconditional. There's always room. It spreads like the shadow of knowledge over a sweeping person. Immortal before, immortal after, but mortal now. Poetry may be didactic. It is certain that it's the best place to mix genres. This may be because narrative expectations, well, Imagine a narrative expector out in a forest at dawn. It shouldn't be taken for a forest ranger. Forest rangers are explainers and law enforcers, but the narrative expector is a hunter. The narrative expector may also be an animal, the object of the hunt. Folk tales, by definition, exist in many versions. For example, the hunter who comes into the forest in this story is, in one version, a cop. But here that would have been all wrong. Here the narrative expector is like a marvelous centaur. <clears throat> now you've exposed your arms. You've stiffened your neck. You are snuffling. You are lying hot in the wet night air by the open window. On this 19th night, with the rain now falling and the branches of a tree knocking against the wall, the sound of the tires of an accelerating bus splatters the silence. You are suddenly awake and shaking with fear. Slowly, though suddenly, you are realizing that all these recognitions are from a past life one that wasn't awful in itself, but is awful now in having been. You are dead. You are hot, not with life, but with fright. It seems that being dead doesn't exclude you. On the other hand, your being dead doesn't exclude your being alive either. You feel the inappropriately blue fabric of the blanket in the close night, like an animal against your arm in the middle of the bed. You'd rather risk the very edge where the sheets are smooth. You experience pulsations of consciousness, spasms of oblivion, followed by involuntarily, inv involuntary recuperative mental balancings. I, you, living demand sustained temptations. Awake, Unconsciousness remains, but like a fingerprint. Life is an antecedent and an in inevitability, but of what?
We have come on our own and will stay. But let's demand something now to know of where we are. Knowledge is embodied and the body is trembling, terrified because it's unprepared. It forgot to get ready. It forgot to pack. It forgot to read. As a result of not testing the real for activity, we begin to wonder who lives. So tomorrow I will torture myself. All that is ordinary will be illegitimate. This will be the consummation of all that is going to be sudden. I am not saying that personal generosity will solve everything. A person can't even solve today by midnight. Generosity cannot bury anonymity. It cannot even take itself as animal. To believe it to be what we truly believe it to be, we must open it. The segments of life taken in separation and laid side by side. Cruelty is always turning kindly aside. It creates a clinical situation, I, a body, turning for speculation. But love exalts only truths that are undemonstrable. They turn true by demanding some activity. So I will say I and remain. <clears throat> it is thus, he says, and falls. Here I am, and this is what I am, and I'm over here. And in the language of the rhinoceros, I am this. What am I? One night I have a dream that is so busy it precludes all creative ideas. I'm furious at myself. I wish I had remembered to project images from it onto a strip of paper. I have gone with a man to get a dachshund, which he insists won't get underfoot since he has trained it to stay in the woods collecting berries. I know this because the film on which my memories are recorded is in black and white. Meanwhile, outside, a street crew is digging up the sidewalk and making a terrible din, and I'm feeling increasingly enraged. We all need a little getaway spot just to assimilate everything and find out what we know. I seize one of the construction workers and point to a window of a house across the street, shouting the woman who lives there is dying. I'm furious at myself. Everyone knows I'm in love with a baseball player named Eugene, but I pretend not to know this, and when everyone is about to shout, I shout too, hey you bum, you fart harder than you hit. But I'm the only one shouting, and Eugene looks at me sadly. I leave the situation unresolved and go up an escalator. Three men are handcuffed to chairs and I hurry to release them. Their handcuffs are made of wood and shaped like ox yokes. This is a gesture of defiance. I know that I'm a very good rock and roll drummer. A spy who resembles Ingrid Bergman is married to one of the prisoners and she asks me to help her escape with him. Instead, when someone telephones, we just pass the phone receiver back and forth in front of the TV and radio. The joke catches us in a display of outrageous self-indulgence. One of the men insists that the bed has its place in this feud. I say, excuse me, I want to change position. I'm an old woman, but I know people expect more than that. Maybe I should just keep my mouth shut and leave my false teeth in permanently. I am afraid of being smothered between the breasts of scientists. The lecturer has announced that he will speak on the topic of pragmatic omniscience. Once the lecture is underway, there can be no thrashing about. Sport, says the lecturer, is dependent on the occasional appearance of wild animals. He presents a slide of a dachshund digging up buried bird bones. This is not a common duck hunter. I say to the host, all now is in the waiting. I worry that my choice of words is somehow suggestive and say, you're being insensitive. I feel a strong sense of duty. Alternative sequences are possible, but I don't know how to trigger the mechanisms for setting them in motion since they are locked. <coughs> Octave. Allegro, nonetheless, sleep 
credulity, frenzy cannot distract. Aristotle acts. Putting orbs and trees in balance come to credulity. <coughs> Sorry. Whispered credulity. Conflict in credulity. Contrast in credulity. It takes credulity to grasp at a varied something. Credulity in the same direction. Credulity becoming more by comparison. Credit credulity. Clutter credulity. Credulity we counter with credulity freely. The credulity of the clown in a mishap, merry miserably. The credulity of the populace umbrellaed in the rain. The credulity of the conscious mind binds it to its intuitions. The credulous proceed. Credulity accrues to the singer who knows the words to her song. The horse pulling the court cart was not credulous. The dog following it was intentionally. Things invite credulity. Events demand credulity. Credulity in yonder mountain forms correctly. Belief goes under. Credulity overcomes three girls playing hopscotch temporarily. Leaping credulity leaps with credulity, stretching credulity, continuing credulity. Insufferable leaping credulity thumps. Suddenly, reverse credulity. The credulous must sudden, sink, or circus. The credulous come from credulity and arrive late askew. Then half from that they proceed. Half again from that some thriving carts shrink as they approach. The thriving carts stop to let rules off. On, tossing credulity, we live vaguely to include complications. Others are never explained. Picnicking with inexplicable credulity, we sit in the shade and form a massive figure. We shift and form another. With credulity provided, we tag walls. Remember credulity and darkness, task at hand. Take credulity for gravity. Lacking credulity, I pull my tongue. Gaining credulity, I rise to speak. I, spall, I scrawl graffiti on the wall and sign one Zola, one waghead, one banquet, one vote, and one honky bitch of the bamboos bamboozled oisie. Everything gives off signs of credible life. The credulous are easy to tease. We seat ourselves comfortably, one by one, and are recognized. Logic goes right out the door, doubt having left it open. Ambivalence can't determine the heights to which we'll climb. An incredible saga. Credulity is incomplete. Why not believe big bodies? Why not ride wild horses? There is no superfluous credulity among us. Credulity is rarely indifferent. Viva, light, light, thick light down the middle and around the sides sets off credulity. Thus the bronze equestrian. Shrink credulity or shimmy it. Calendar credulity or cost it. Come singer and prove the song. Credulity recedes to the background. Credulity returns as a result. Credulity in motion, encompassing credulity. Let's just hope that farm animals stay more credible than military figures in a field. Thus the bronze equestrian. Stravinsky, what a genius. See circus and believe it, can we? Indeed, personal credulity, credited credulity. Credulity slips into the cot. We can chronicle credulity. An incredible drama, January through October, we confess credulity. The moonlight is critical. Oh, 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 says the voice of a girl. I've been attacked by owls, by owls with towels. I've been attacked by snakes with rakes. It is just this kind of ridiculous language, banal but lacking even banality's pretense at relevance and sense that I hear in my sleep. I wake feeling irritable and depressed. <laughs> Dreams don't provide the thrill of sleep. Waking does. Sleep only exists in memory. 
It's imaginary. I can sleep my sleep, but I can't observe it. I often feel that I've earned it, deserved, and I'm crazed when it's disturbed. And with all this dreamy wordplay, I wish I could preserve it, and with it, it's dreams. I dream an honest sleep. I dream of Ovid, and later I would repeat what he said. Or Ovid would dream. He'd stare at me. Even now, he pins philosophical dilemmas on no one but on their interests. I dream of birdmen, of watermen, of airmen pursuing women, of new shapes. I dream of Ovid awake as he opens his mouth and rubs his face on the ground. We'd speak of weasels and of stars. We'd speak of Scheherazade. We would shift, giving way to speakers within and to speakers within that. Matter, we know, would shift. Thought, we know, would pursue. People fly after their metaphors. But in sleep, they seldom realize their dreams. The birds and waters hardly act at all. But stories are transformations. There is that preceding the what of this. Animal, then lull, or lull first, then pull, and burial. I seem to have chosen all the really dark poems from this book. Um, inside my body are hellish viscera, whose flames burn everything I eat. Oh, fly, enter my mouth and go to hell. Oh, grape, roll back on my tongue and descend. I exhale the smoldering fumes of all I've consumed. As the alarm clocks go off, we say to ourselves, it's time, or to each other we say it, and elbows to bed, hands to head, nude, nightgowned, or pajamaed, we rise, some to the left, some to the right, as if into a dream, or out of many, and why? When we sleep, like geese, we're free. When we wake, like geese, we feed on wheat and milk, which we find melancholy, and why? It's viscous and white and thick. It shines back at us its round and simple, placid face, which we can scarcely irritate or imitate, though we bare our teeth, take it on our tongue, grow gray with age, and die like paper turned to ash, taking flight, as all things must, that are white as cumulus clouds, flat at the bottom, and round on top, they rarely produce precipitation ev evaporating as the sun sets through a broken ring, smashed by a hammer, hitting the hand of a woman once a girl, and that girl once a bride, who married a simpleton named Napoleon, or Ned, who led a life of scholarship, eating candy and drawing circles, whose value has increased so much that now, at 715, each is worth 71.5 times more than it was around a quarter of a century ago, and why? Ghosts are made of light and disappear as the sun shines, achieving new naivetes, butts bare, buttholes exposed to alarming shittings of embarrassing excrement, dropping in dreams, and why? Between the buttocks lie secrets we cannot keep to ourselves, of experiences that knock us on the brow, that resonate, and we let them. We can't help it. See how the film, running back, shows ripples closing in like initiates to a circle or animals to a pool from which they're chased back out by a man with a stick. And why? Because he has a stick, and he's a man, and those are animals. A gazelle is among them, and a camel, a poodle, and more women than I can name Hilda, Crystal, or Diane, about whose neck hangs an instrument designed for seeing birds on the wing or on the branch of the family tree on whose green boughs my grandfather publicly, grumpy and sweet in the yard, found some edible fruits unripe when placed in a basket as a child tucks a doll like Samantha, born in 1904, or Nellie, born in 1906, both of whom come by mail with a book, seeamericangirl.com, that adds to the story of life, a 19th century fiction that they helped to make history when time too was young and tomatoes were inedible. 
I mean, but there's no way to correct a dream. I was always afraid when I did that, somebody would think I was suddenly having a seizure or something. <laughs> I should read it with more animation and really make it look like I was having a seizure um, or a dream. The wife of the merchant George sat plotting. The merchant George sat ironing. Their little daughter, Greta, was in the corner playing with a roll of film. Snip, snip, snip. One frame after another fell onto the table. This is pleasant secretarial work, said little Greta, chewing the end of one of her bra braids. Klondike, Klondike, said the parrot. The merchant George had received the parrot as a gift from a morose lawyer in San Francisco who claimed to be descended from Jack London. Descended is the operative term, said the wife of merchant George, who was a cynic. She was never envious, but often jealous, and she was apt to become stricken with grief whenever the merchant George was away from home, even slightly longer than expected. Like Penelope, she kept a loom in the bedroom, and she displayed her passions by weaving flamboyant fabrics. She called them displacements and regarded them as proof of her emotional maturity. George, you are an emotional baby, she said, as she settled baby Samuel onto her lap and slid his first taste of rice cereal across his lips. Skeptically, baby Samuel spat it out. What, I wonder, has happened to them all? Is it the same thing that has happened to me? Perhaps someone wrong enough is right to be wrong. Perhaps nations ought not to hunt people they care nothing about. Necessity is a state of incapacity, but perhaps incapacity is a state of necessity. Everything changes, but perhaps the whole remains, although it seems unlikely as well as undesirable. There is nothing but reality. Once there was a man named Task in life, and there is no perhaps about that. There can't be perhaps about anything that is, but perhaps there is. Perhaps this task in life was a poor soldier with holes in his boots, a bad back and warped arrows. Every proposition comes to an end, but perhaps the end brought about by a negation is more of an end than an end brought about by an affirmation. Something cannot be more or less of an end so the end pronounced by yes and the end announced by no are equally false ends. Perhaps there was once a horse named predication, but perhaps it was called trepidation or shadow. Loyalty tolerates a degree of doubt in its vicinity, but doubt has a tendency to turn a vicinity into a swamp in which a soldier like task in life is apt to get his boots sucked off. If there once was a horse known as High Spot, the distinction between High Spot and a star would have been clear. High Spot, a mollusk, show tunes, vivacity, and a star. Perhaps affirmation prolongs what it affirms. Negation curtails what it negates. But the temporal advantage that affirmation has over negation is probably insignificant. But perhaps at this point, the notion that nothing is in insignificant should be affirmed. Perhaps noise moves the air, perhaps the air moves noise, and perhaps we can have it both ways. Doubt is a source of questions, but questions are also a source of doubt. Perhaps everything ends gradually in a single dilemma, but if so, the dilemma in question is suddenly limitless. Perhaps plants live upside down, or perhaps they eat with their feet. She hears a shout, maybe a curse. She closes the window. She feels for the floor. She puts her ear to the window. She puts icing on the cake. She's content to be where she just happens to be found. She sees pigeons in flight, pigeons overcast. And I read about it later. This woman had character. She preserved desire and eliminated repentance.
I pamper myself by completing mundane tasks. I pose before the judge or the editor, but dogs leap out and I am immediately apologetic and willing to pay even more than the thing is worth. I leave a big tip, which simply flaunts my empathy. Sentimental people wage war against numerous evils and they count them. The count might come out nine dead, 30 injured, and 100 sick, or there might be no one dead but endless injustice. My empathies are banal. They are derivative and inconsequential. I want to succumb to the intoxicating bang, bang, bang of an action it is unwise to take. Its incongruity might be added to my account. It might serve as an accomplishment. But when I pose as the author, I'm sure to exaggerate. All right, one last one. I have this to say, but I do not know when to. There was a great forest that I went to. I may never return there, but I want to. I have just one memory of it, and I want to. Thanks. Thank you.